got involved working on the installer and other stuff, and then became a, a member of the FreeBSD source committers. And then the bunch of silly people in the FreeBSD project decided to elect me to the core team. Uh, in my day job, I'm the architect of the Scale Engine CDN, which does video streaming. Uh, we're actually streaming this live, if people can actually see me. Um, and I also recently co-authored two books, FreeBSD Mastery ZFS and Advanced ZFS uh, with Michael Lucas. They're for sale out in the hallway. If you want an autograph after, just find me. Uh, and I host a podcast every week, bsdnow.tv. Uh, we, the crux of most episodes is an interview with a developer. I uh, interviewed a bunch of the people I see sitting around the room. Uh, we're on like episode 190 something. It comes out. Uh, it's recorded live every Wednesday and comes out usually Thursday or Friday, uh, very reliably every week for the last 195 weeks in a row. Uh, and I use a lot of ZFS, and I have to move data around the world a lot, and I like to use SSH for that. So we use SSH for bulk data transfer because, uh, especially using ZFS, uh, now that we have resumable send, thank you to the people from Delphix, um, when I have to send data from Toronto to Australia or Germany or whatever, um, the easiest way to coordinate the res resumption of an interrupted connection is having a bidirectional channel like SSH. Uh, and it's just much easier to facilitate than trying to use something like Netcat and have it configured on both ends and try to pass the resume token over some other channel or something. Uh, but we have four primary use cases for bulk data transfer over SSH. The first is just ZFS replication. Uh, we're trying to replicate between servers uh, on a LAN on, you know, at the racks in the data center, but also we have a metro connection that goes uh, from Toronto to my basement about 75 kilometers away where all the backup servers are so that if we need the backups, they can go in the back of the car directly out of the rack in my basement. Uh, and so now that our LAN connections went from one gig to 10 gig, uh, or we got this main connection that's about one milliseconds of latency uh, or so uh, at a gigabit, suddenly we needed better performance than we were able to get out of SSH by default. You know, we were, we were running into other bottlenecks and not saturating the whole 10 gig link between back-to-back -back servers uh, using SSH. Uh, and I knew ZFS could put out 10 gigabits, so why wasn't it, why couldn't SSH handle it? Uh, the other thing we do is we do the uh, video distribution, but another one of the things we do is the uh, packages and ISO downloads for TrueOS, uh, one of the desktop spins of FreeBSD. And so for that, we have a ZFS data set for the ISOs. It's 200 and something gigs. And we ZFS replicate it to servers all over the world, including you know, Germany or, or Melbourne, Australia. Uh, with a latency of 240 milliseconds, the bandwidth delay product gets very high. You need an awfully large uh, socket buffer in order to actually get more than a couple of megabits between Toronto and Australia. Yes? Are you saying that that's how TrueOS actually gets mirrored? Yes. Cool. Uh, works very nice, does incrementals. We take a snapshot of a data set on a server every 15 minutes, and they throw files in there, and they appear by the mirrors that way. Uh, it's coordinated. The, the big reason they did this is we also do the packages for the downloads. And the entire package set, which could be a couple hundred gigs, needs to be atomically switched over from so that you know the package metadata and the actual packages are consistent at any one second. Uh, and so they use uh, rsync with delayed update to upload all the files to us in a hidden directory and then atomically rename them all at once. And this has two advantages. First, we replicate it out in 15 minute chunks so all the servers are getting the data uh, as it's being uploaded. And as soon as it's done, they can all flip it into place. Uh, the other one we looked at was having them ship us snapshots directly off their side, but they haven't set up that side yet. Or I haven't either, and Chris is in the room so I can blame him. <laughs> so uh, the one we have is ZFS replication over the LAN. This one is where we have servers that are pulling data uh, from our master site uh, over SSH. So we have a send case and a receive case in this particular one. Uh, another one we have is our recording servers. So we have uh, servers around the world where we ingest the live video stream, like this one, 
and we record it on the server. Um, for the ones where we do uh, multi-bit rate, where we take in a high bit rate stream and transcode it down to lower bit rates uh, for you, so you can watch it on your cell phone or whatever, or if you have a weaker internet connection, um, those ones sadly are Linux because we need it for the video drivers. But uh, our video servers, the FreeBSD ones and the Linux ones, will collect these recordings and then they use an rsync job to move individual files when they're done recording uh, back to our central ZFS storage servers. And so in this case, we're pushing uh, via rsync over SSH. And in particular, some of those servers are Linux, and so it was, it's much more difficult to get uh, a consistent set of SSH patches on them. Right? Uh, on FreeBSD, we can build uh, open SSH with the HPN patches and push that package out to all of our machines, but there's no pre-built package for that for CentOS. And so it's a bit more work. And there's that. Uh, so in this case, we have servers all over that want to push data back to the master site. So that's a different use case. Uh, but with that one, we could use, if we come up with our own patches, we could use a modified version of SSH because they are our servers. The fourth use case, though, is customers uploading videos to us. So for video on demand content, where they've gone and produced a video and want to distribute it now, they send it to us over SSH or SFTP or, or whatever. Um, in that case, we have no control over the version of SSH that the end user is using. Uh, so even if we come up with some really cool hacks for SSH to make it faster, our, our customers are not going to have that version of SSH. They're going to have the stock version, who knows how many versions old that they're, whatever machine they're using is. You know, they have a 10-year-old copy of WinSCP on their Windows box or something, right? Um, and so we wanted to look at what we could do to the SSH server to be able to receive data faster from them uh, without requiring any modifications to the client on their side. So the first thing we looked at was these set of patches called HPN, or High Performance Networking. Uh, there are a set of patches that first started being developed in 2004 at, uh, I think it's the Pittsburgh uh, Supercomputer Center uh, in the US. Um, back then, the default window size for SSH was 64 to 128 kilobytes. Uh, the idea there is, you know, in your text interactive terminal session, you don't want to buffer up a bunch of data. You know, if you cat, accidentally cat a 20 gigabyte file or something, you want the control C you send to get there in a reasonable amount of time and that data to stop coming at you over your dial-up connection. Um, so they did some work. Uh, the problem is, with a, such a small buffer, uh, because SSH doesn't let the TCV socket buffer do its auto sizing, it forces a small window uh, to deal with these high, ba uh, high latency links and so on. Um, so what they did with the HPN patch was optimistically, if, if both sides are HPN, it will grow that buffer using the TCP tuning in the OS. So basically, have SSH get a little bit more out of the way and let the OS decide what the socket buffer should be. Or if only one side is HPN, it will at least use a larger buffer of two megabytes. Uh, that two megabyte limit actually came from uh, a, an assert statement in OpenSSH versions older than 3.8 uh, that would crash if you tried to have a bigger buffer. But as of 2007, when OpenSSH 4.7 came out, the default window size in SSH went up to two megabytes. And so a lot of the advantages of the HPM patch kind of were in upstream at that point, although not all of it. So one of the things we found is that the HPM patches added a feature where on the receiving side of the, or on the, on the client side, you can optionally set the receive buffer size. So it calls set sock opt and forces the buffer to a bigger size. Uh, that only works in the case where the HPN patched uh, SSH version is on the receiving side of the connection. If you're pushing data, then setting your receive buffer bigger doesn't do you any good. Um, but uh, with this, for our servers that are receiving the mirrored data for the, the PCBSD and TrueOS, it allowed them to set a larger socket buffer, and instead of relying on the OS auto growing up to its size, we could also we could specify a much bigger size and get to it right away, and not have to ramp up the connection. Which made a big difference in, uh, you know, when you're replicating smaller amounts of data. You know, what 
Chris could upload from his house in 15 minutes. Uh, would only take about two minutes for our servers to replicate at a gigabit. Uh, so having that be only take two minutes instead of three because we didn't have to wait for the socket buffer to grow up to 24 megabytes uh, made a difference. Uh, and the biggest one though is the bandwidth delay product. It means that you know even if you have just 10 milliseconds of delay uh, with a four megabyte socket buffer, which is double the default in pretty much every OS, uh, it means the theoretical maximum bandwidth that you have available to you is 3,300 megabits, even though you have a 10 gigabit link. Uh, now, if you send that up to 160, or uh, sorry, yes, so in my test setup where I created a virtual link that has 10 milliseconds of latency but can still do 10 gigabits, Netcat was able to get almost all the way up to the bandwidth delay product of 3,300 uh, megabits per second. But when we used SSH, we found it only ever got to about 160 megabits uh, because the socket buffer would never grow to four megabytes, but would stay at 128K, or, or two megabytes in this case. Uh, and then we found with HPN, it could receive data quickly up to about 1,300 megabits, so not maximizing the bandwidth delay product, but at least getting a more acceptable performance number. But if you tried to push data, send, it was only getting 175 megabits. But the reality is that, you know, the delay between Toronto and Melbourne, Australia is not 10 milliseconds. Uh, but even if you're just going to Europe at 100 milliseconds of latency, then with your four megabyte socket buffer, you're down to 335 megabits per second of throughput. So even though I'm paying for gigabit at both sides, unless I can get a bigger socket buffer and get SSH to actually use it, then the maximum bandwidth I could theoretically get is 335 megabits. What I would actually get would be a lot less than that. Uh, and just stock SSH, because of another bug I'll get into later where it wasn't putting the right amount of pressure on the socket for the OS to grow the buffer, it meant that the socket buffer never actually got above about 128 or 192K. And so the actual performance I would get was between 9 and 14 megabits, which is not a lot when you're hoping for at least 300. Uh, is there any way to have DFS send split data over multiple streams? So you could use several SSH, several TCP connections? Not in ZFS, but there are tools like BBCP that are supposed to be able to do that. I've looked at it a little bit, but I managed to fix these problems, so I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> right, uh, so with HPN, it was able to do 180 megabits, which is half-ish of what the theoretical limit is, so that's not so bad. Uh, if we crank the socket buffer up to 32 megabytes, the problem is stock SSH doesn't get any better because it's only using like 192K of the socket buffer anyway. Uh, but with HPN, we could actually saturate the gigabit we wanted. So yay. Uh, but you know that was still a lot less than what the bandwidth delay product says we could have gotten if we actually had the 10 gigabits. So we found uh, that manually setting the HPN TCB receive buff setting was giving us <laughs> acceptable transfer speeds because we were getting that socket buffer right away. Um, but when we looked into it and read the code in the comments, we figured out specifically at least on FreeBSD, that the dynamic socket buffer growing feature that HPN had wasn't actually working. It was the, the condition that made it try to grow the SSH window size by 150% never actually triggered. Uh, because its condition was when the amount of data in the SSH window, which is the amount of data that's been sent but not acknowledged yet, um, is greater than the size of the, or sorry, when the size of the socket buffer is greater than the size of the amount of data we have pending, then expand the size of the buffer. The problem is that the, unless you try to send more data, the socket buffer will not grow. And so it just never happened. Um, it's interesting, on, on Linux, the result you get from get socket opt about the socket buffer is different. It's what the maximum is, not what the current state is. Uh, and so, it seems the HPN thing assumed everybody was using Linux. 
Um, so anyway, we found that the code there that was supposed to make this all magically work was never actually growing it beyond maybe 256k because it just wasn't putting enough pressure to trigger the growing of the socket buffer by the OS's uh, TCP stack. So we looked into it and there's a, there's a function called uh, channel check window and it checks the size of the, the SSH window. Uh, around version 4.7, uh, a helpful OpenBSD developer added a feature that said, if this is, uh, or what it does is it sends an acknowledgement every time we've sent three packets. Uh, and so the amount of data that's pending is never very high. Uh, and so because we're sliding the window forward constantly, this causes two things. A, you can end up sending twice as many packets back when you're actually receiving. So you're downloading data and you're getting it at you know, hundreds of megabits a second, but the little stream going back that's supposed to be just acts has enough, uh, twice as many packets per second of SSH control messages going back the other way because you're sending an ACK every three, uh, 32K packets uh, in, in like SSH packets in this case. Uh, and so that behavior in particular was conflicting with FreeBSD's socket buffer sizing and causing it never to get very big. So I added an extra check to that that says, continue to do that if this is an interactive session because you want to have a very interactive, low latency connection when you're trying to you know, run commands. But if this is not an interactive session because I'm piping something into SSH, then don't do that and fall back to the traditional behavior of send an act every time we filled half of the entire window. Uh, and then suddenly things were a lot less terrible. Uh, so the patch that I've made, uh, I have two different versions of this. The first version is a patch against the HPN patches uh, and does it in that framework. I've since made another version that's against stock SSH, so you don't have to have the HPN patches. And I think I can convince them to upstream it because it's, it's only a couple of lines and it's, it's not doing anything terrible. Whereas the HPN patch set has a reputation with the SSH people because it includes a, a null encryption option and a bunch of other things that they're just not interested in. But anyway, with the change here, it means if it's a non-interactive session, then we only uh, send back a, a window resize to the other side uh, over the SSH protocol once half of the local window has been consumed. And at that point, we pull the size of the socket buffer from the OS, and if the amount of outstanding data we have is close to that buffer, then we expand the size uh, by 150% so that we can put more pressure on it, hopefully growing that socket buffer even more until we hit whatever tuning limit the OS has set, uh, allowing us to maximize the available bandwidth delay product as controlled by the system configuration on what that maximum should be. Uh, and yeah, we'll get into that later. So with this fix in place, now SSH both send and receive got much more reasonable speeds uh, when we had the high bandwidth delay product. So when going to 100 or 200, 300 milliseconds of latency, uh, because we were actually using all of the socket buffer that I was making available for 32 megabytes to try to overcome the bandwidth delay product, it was actually working now. Uh, the change is restricted to non-interactive mode so that you don't end up having to wait through 32 megabytes of text data coming at you in your interactive session and making it all unresponsive and annoying. Uh, you know, SSHing from your phone, you don't want to have to wait for your phone to download 32 megabytes before the control C takes effect. Uh, so this is uh, some experiments I did on a machine in the FreeBSD test cluster. Uh, these across the bottom are the different uh, socket buffer sizes and then the performance of the various patched versions of SSH I played with. And the blue line is the theoretical limit from the uh, bandwidth delay product. Uh, this graph is all at a 25 millisecond latency. Uh, there's more detailed version of this uh, in the paper I wrote for Asia BSDCon. But I'll go over this a little bit more later. Uh, but in particular, the big orange bar you see is netcat. So this is no SSH. Uh, and then 
if you look at the results we get from stock unmodified SSH, the HPN version, uh, or sorry, uh, this is stock SSH, this is stock SSH with my three line patch, the HPN results, which are about the same, and then finally, uh, Something like that. <laughs> Graph's too small. Anyway, so we found that the uh, nice thing to do is if you use the TCP receive buff option in HPN, you can just skip all this auto growing stuff and go right to whatever size you want. In particular, there are two different settings that control the socket buffer size in FreeBSD. There's <coughs> one for the auto tuning that sets the maximum that you want to auto tune to, and then there's another one that controls what the maximum anybody can actually use is. If those values are different, it allows you to say, you know, for connections coming into my web server, I never want to allow the TCP socket buffer to grow beyond two megabytes. But for this one SSH session where I've explicitly done a set socket opt to a big number, I want to allow a TCP socket buffer of 64 megabytes so that the stream to Australia is not slow. Uh, so avoids the situation where somebody could try to do some kind of denial of service attack against you and cause you to queue up, you know, a thousand connections. These were 64 megabytes of data in the socket buffer. Uh, so only on connections where you explicitly ask for it, you get the large socket buffer, but your auto tuning for, you know, regular web serving or something doesn't grow that high. Uh, so having this option I found to be very useful. And it also means that the first five minutes or so of the connection are not going at low speed as it slowly builds up the socket buffer. But I decided what I needed was to extend this further so it works in the push case. In the case where I'm, I'm the recording server and I have this bunch of video and I want to send it back to the storage server. Uh, so we extended it with a patch that, that uh, adds a remote receive buffer option. So the client says to the server, hey, if you wouldn't mind, could you set your receive buffer to 64 megabytes? Uh, and there's a, I added a config option on the SSH server side that allows you to set what the limit to that will be. Uh, and the OS won't let you set a value larger than the, what your tunable is set to anyway. Um, and you can use the match options in the SSHD config to say only this user can set a larger socket buffer, not just anybody, uh, so that you can use it for your, your own purposes but not have other people using it against you or something. Uh, so then I just have some tuning tips on how you can get better performance out of SSH. Um, so for bulk transfers, it's a uh, desirable to avoid increasing the maximum size of the automatic tuning of the socket buffer. So you don't want to have every socket buffer be able to use 64 megabytes because, you know, you don't want to queue up that much data out of every person that's trying to connect your web server, but you want specific things to be able to use a, a larger socket buffer. So you tune the maximum buffer size to a very large value, uh, being extremely high, but you tune the auto scaling to a much more reasonable number. So default connections will use the reasonable number, but specific connections where you need it, you can set it to a much larger value. Uh, so those sysctls are, you have uh, net.inet.tcp.send space and receive space. Those control the initial size for the very first part of the connection. Then you have um, send and receive buff max, which is the maximum for the auto scaling. Uh, and then you have uh, send and receive buff inc which is the increment, how much it grows each round trip if the growth is warranted. Uh, be careful setting this very large. It seems to actually make things worse. Uh, because if you don't end up, you know, when I, in one of the benchmarks, I set this to like 256K. But because the packets coming out of SSH are only 32K at a time, it never grew, it never tried to send a whole 256K at a time. So the socket buffer never grew off the bottom post. It just sat at the lowest value because we never put enough pressure to cause it to go up one notch. Uh, so in most of the benchmarks I did, I found while it takes a little longer to get to the maximum speed, not setting this very to larger than the default worked better. Although I think that's probably something that should be addressed in the, the 
auto grow code in, in FreeBSD rather than uh, elsewhere. There's also a sysctl to just disable the automatic buffer management and say, you know, unless somebody asks for a bigger buffer, all they get is the default 64K uh, receive and 32K send window. But the last one is uh, kern.ipc.maxsockbuff, which controls the maximum size of the socket buffer. But that one's slightly confusing in that it's the amount of memory the socket buffer can take uh, or can consume, not the amount of data that can be in the socket buffer. Uh, so it's actually, you know, for every 2K segment, you also have 256 bytes of overhead for the MBuff. So if you want to allow a maximum socket buffer size of 64 megabytes, you have to set this value to at least 72 megabytes to account for the management overhead of the MBuffs. Uh, and so you know, if you set it to 64 megabytes and then ask SSH for a 64 megabyte socket buffer, you'll be told not enough buffer space available. That one confused me for a while. I'm like, I've said the maximum is 8 megabytes. Why can't I have 8 megabytes? So one of the other things we did with the HPN patches, especially over the LAN, was using their option called the none cipher. So, you know, I'm just going over my LAN. I don't really need to encrypt all this data. I just like using SSH for the setting up the, the commands on either side. Um, the way this actually works is the connection starts out encrypted so that your credentials and all the keys stuff still happens and your username and password if you send it or your keys or whatever still happen over an encrypted connection. But once it starts, once it passes the command it wants to run, and that command actually starts and you open the channel back and forth, it rekeys the connection to having no encryption. It still has a MAC to verify that the data hasn't been modified, but it has no encryption. Uh, this is great for, you know, local LAN replication over ZFS because you don't need to spend all the CPU time encrypting and decrypting. Um, <coughs> So you can enable that, and it has a bunch of protection to make sure that you can't ever spawn a shell where you're going to be typing commands back and forth, and they'll be visible to other people. Because you, know, you might input a password in the password command or something, and you don't want that to ever be not encrypted. So starting in 2011, we started using the HPN patch version of uh, SSH that Brian has kept working for us for all this time in the port tree um, to accelerate our ZFS replication, especially over the LAN. But for things like the PCBSD mirrors, that's not private data, so we're fine with doing no encryption over the internet in that case. Uh, and it made it possible over the LAN to saturate, you know, a one gigabit, uh, one gigabit internet uh, LAN connection without using a lot of CPU. Uh, and the other performance improvements they had were pretty good as well. Enough for the LAN anyway. Uh, However, the HPM patch doesn't seem to help very much outside of you know, manually requesting a larger receive window, uh, and it only works on the receiving side, like we mentioned before. The none cipher, it turns out, uh, in my testing, is actually slower than some of the newer modern ciphers, which confused me greatly for a while. Uh, turns out, because the none cipher still uses a Mac, and the Mac it uses is UMAC64, uh, which I think is a Dan Bernstein thing, right? Uh, but I read the paper for it, and it was written in 2002 and benchmarked on like a Pentium 2. And it was like, it's super fast on a Pentium 2. <laughs> it turns out it's actually not that fast. Uh, and so when I was trying to test at 10 gigabits or more, uh, it turns out it was a, a very strong bottleneck. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? So. Uh, I borrowed two machines out of the FreeBSD test cluster, which is donated by a company called Centex uh, out in Kitchener, kind of a ways from here, but in Canada. Uh, so they have these E5 1650s, so that's a high-end server, but single socket. <coughs> so you get uh, six cores at 3.5 gigahertz. It's got 32 gigs of RAM. They have these really nice Chelsea 40 gigabit NICs connected back to back with no switch or anything in the way. Uh, we installed FreeBSD 11 on them. Uh, I had the base version of SSH, uh, the HPN patch version of SSH from ports, and uh, my various fixed versions of that. So the first set of measurements I did, uh, the default cipher in SSH has been uh, uh, 
Cha Cha 20, Poly 1305 for a while. Um, because it doesn't benefit from things like AES and I, because it's uh, not AES, uh, the most we could get out of it, even with 3.5 gigahertz processor on each side, was 1900 megabits. So while it, the reason SSH chose this is because they wanted a not AES cipher to use for your, their SSH connections, and it makes sense for your regular interactive connections maybe, uh, but when you're trying to do bulk transfer, you probably want to choose a different default. Uh, AES uh, CBC, depending on you, 128 or 256, you can get between 2,500 and 3 gigabits per second. Uh, with AES CTR, you can get up to almost 5 gigabits a second. With the MEM cipher, I got 5,800 uh, megabits per second. But with AES GCM, because uh, this machine is new enough to have the AVX instructions to do the 128-bit uh, division, and it has AES and I, I could actually get 8.5 gigabits per second. Yes, so all of the, uh, so Cha Cha 20 does uh, the Poly 1305 uh, for the Mac, uh, or it's AEAD that way. Uh, all of the AES ones were using the UMAC 64 uh, Mac, the same as the Nuncipher one. Uh, but because AES, uh, GCM, and Poly, uh, Cha Cha 20 are authenticated ciphers, they provide their own Mac that is used instead. And that's why AES GCM ends up being faster because in one pass over the data, you get the encryption and the MAC in one pass and don't have to run the UMAC, which is the slow part. Uh, I did a benchmark of all the MACs, and UMAC 64 is the fastest of the available ones in SSH, even though it's still <laughs> terribly slow. So by using AES GCM, you can actually get more speed than having no encryption because you end up not having to do a second pass over the data to get a MAC. Uh, whereas Netcat, you can actually saturate pretty much all of the available 40 gigabits. Although not if you use a pipe, it turns out. <laughs> the original test I, I did with Netcat uh, for my benchmarks was like, you know, Netcat to, on the one side of the Netcat was DD, you know, dev zero with a one megabyte block size into Netcat, and on the other side was Netcat and DD it back to dev null. And with that, the best throughput I could get was about 23 gigabits a second. And I thought, that was as fast as it would go. But it turns out if you just do netcat redirect from dev zero and netcat redirect to dev null on the other side, you can actually get all 40 gigabits, which led me down a whole other rabbit hole. And uh, Rod Grimes and Tico Nightingale are working on a new page flipping thing for pipes to make them faster. Uh, and hopefully, we'll get faster pipes out of my confusing benchmarking results. Yes, so yeah, uh, iperf can get the 40 gigabits too. Or the 30, about the same as the netcat. If you can give it the socket buffer. Yeah. But yes, uh, we, I tested with iperf first to make sure that everything was working. Uh, and I was a little confused why netcat would be slower than iperf. It was like, it's not doing that much. But it turns out um, in FreeBSD with a pipe, the default buffer size for a pipe is 16K. And it can grow based on the size of the reason writes up to 64K, uh, but that's the limit. And it, the file was like last modified in 1996 or something. Um, so I have another patch I worked on that's uh, going to be up for review soon that just makes it attunable so that you can set it to like 256K or a one megabyte. And all of a sudden now, single threaded uh, through a pipe, you can, instead of doing five gigabits a second, you can do 13 gigabits a second. Or sorry, gigabytes per second. Uh, and you know that makes a big difference when you're trying to do this. So yes, uh, <coughs> these numbers end up being quite a bit different than the ones I did. I presented in Tokyo because I figured out my problem was actually that I was hitting a bottleneck in the pipe in the operating system. So I was a little confused at first about why having no encryption was slower than having encryption. Uh, but it turns out because AESGCM is an authenticated cipher and is basically you get a Mac for free as part of the encryption. Uh, it means it doesn't use UMAC and that we don't have to read all of the data twice, once to encrypt it, once to Mac it. Uh, so while the NUN cipher, you know, even in its best day was doing six gigabits, AES GCM could do nine gigabits. 
So I wondered, well, over the LAN, I don't really need a back, right? ZFS is doing a checksum on every block anyway uh, as part of the replication because with resumable replication, each record in the ZFS send stream has its own checksum now instead of only one big checksum over the whole stream. So I was like, how hard would it be to just make it not do a MAC? Uh, so I basically added OpenSSL's null MAC transform as one of the options, kept all the existing restrictions that the nun cipher has. So you can't start a shell, you know, you can't get a TTY, uh, all the basic things that are already there, uh, and added that as an option. Uh, and just like the nun cipher it prints out a big scary warning every time you use it to make sure you know you're using it and all that stuff. Using the nun Mac, there's no encryption and no Mac. With the patch version of SSH, I was able to get much closer to the results that Netcat was getting. Uh, it was about 80% of the performance of Netcat pre-figuring out that pipes were my problem. <laughs> uh, not quite as, as good anymore, but it turns out that uh, AESCTR can actually keep up if you don't make it do a Mac as well. So with this combination, uh, AESCBC with no Mac can actually get up to about 4.5 gigabits. Your AESGCM numbers are about the same uh, because you're still doing the Mac as part of the, the encryption. But AESCTR with no Mac can actually get as high as 10 gigabits on this 3.5 gigahertz processor. But Doing none at all, SSH could actually shuffle 13 gigabits. And uh, originally Netcat topped out at 23, but with the pipe fix, it can now do 36 uh, gigabits. So now that we have the none cipher and the none Mac, we can actually still get faster than encrypted, which is what we expected to happen. <laughs> and we were very confused when that wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. which you've described as being a substantial amount of your grants, right? Yep. Where you don't care about the authentication, you don't care about data modification, you don't care about encryption. Why are you using SSH instead of Netcat? Because I need to start the right ZFS command on the other side, and because I might need to pass the resumption token to uh, resume the replication in the right spot. And because the script I used to coordinate all this uses SSH to go to the other side, get a list of the snapshots, compare that to the snapshots on this side, decide what to do, and it's just SSH was easier. Okay. It was a passive least resistance compared to trying to coordinate a netcat. Yeah. Sorry, I lost my place. Any other questions while I find my slides? Uh, the number you presented with SSH Mm -hmm. uh, new cipher. Mm -hmm. Is that also include the pipe fix? Yes. Uh, originally, I stopped investigating when I uh, got almost to the netcat number. I still need to go back and, and see if there's anything else I could do to get even more performance out of the null encryption option uh, with the null Mac. Uh, I have a flame graph coming up that shows that I think I've done everything I can. Right, so switching off the crypto, the slide viewer program on TrueOS is really laggy. It takes a very long time to render each slide. Uh, the Lumina PDF viewer. Ken's here somewhere, I think. What's that? There is no Lumina PDF viewer yet. It's being written specifically to address that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so his fault. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there we are. Now we're caught up. Yeah, so at this point, uh, I thought I had reached the limit of what tuning and small patches to SSH could do. Uh, there's a decrease graph on the next slide that I'll show uh, that shows pretty much all the CPU time uh, being used by SSH is spent in memcopy, memset, and realloc. Uh, there's no time being spent on the encryption anymore because we've no encryption and no Mac. Um, and so other than re-architecting SSH to try to do fewer copies or something or bigger buffers, there's not much more that you squeeze out of SSH. But 
13 gigabits is enough to saturate my 10 gigabits between my home servers, so I'm done. <laughs> it's you guys' problem now. Uh, is, you know, at this point, yes, it's not much point in going further and abusing SSH. You know, it's already well outside the scope of what SSH was meant to do. Uh, if you really need to do 40 gigabits, you should probably just use Netcat or something. Or uh, like Colin mentioned, uh, BBCP that can use multiple TCP flows uh, to spread out your data and recon reconstitute it on the other side. So yeah, this flame graph, you can see we're running SSH main in the client loop and uh, you end up in mem copy, mem copy, uh, mem copy, mem copy, mem set. And yeah, you spend all your time in libc, not in SSH, so I've done all I can do. Uh, so, you know, at some point you're stuck with how fast your operating system and your processor can copy memory around. Uh, and it turns out that scales quite linearly with the frequency. So this is uh, the non-cipher AESGCM, the non-MAC version, and Netcat uh, at each of, uh, this is gigabits per second, and each of these lines is the processor speed scaling from 1,200, 1,500, uh, 2,000, 2,500, 3,500, and uh, 3,500 plus turbo boost. Hmm? Ah, so you can see the transfer speed you get is scales exactly as you'd expect with the CPU speed of the machine. Yes. Have you seen any issues about the window size of TCP being 32 bits only? Uh, no, the maximum window size you're allowed in TCP, the protocol specification is one gigabyte, so that the you can't wrap the, the number around and, and acknowledge bytes that haven't been sent yet or something. Uh, so specifically, because it's 32 bits, uh, the TCP protocol specification says it can't be greater, the window can't be greater than one gigabyte, uh, so that the acts you're getting, since the sequence number is only 32-bit, uh, you don't want to, it has to be able to make sure it, it's not wrapping. And so. And the chart is sufficient, one gigabyte as a maximum. You yeah. haven't made any thoughts about in the future, maybe we need to have 64-bit TCP. Yeah. Hopefully we won't still be using IPv4 by then, right? <laughs> <laughs> I amuse myself. Uh, wouldn't you expect this to be linear to the memory frequency more than the CPU frequency? A little bit, but uh, it's not as easy to change that in your benchmarks. It's <laughs> 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 just running CCD, uh, you know, dev.cpu0.frequency equals each one off the list of supported frequencies for that yeah. processor. Yeah, uh, that might be worth trying as well. To uh, me, that kind of indicates that there's still a lot of the stuff in the CPU cache. Yeah, um, in, the, in the separate pipe benchmarks I did, I found that the sweet spot for the uh, buffer size for the pipe is like a little bit less than half of your L3 cache size, uh, so that the page flipping that's there happens uh, in all inside the L3 and, and you don't blow it out. <coughs> yeah. In the uh, in, uh, Netflix talk in Tokyo, the, uh, with the 100 gigabit uh, TLS encryption, they have shown like uh, if you go from DDR4 with 1.8 APS to 2.41, like 3% or so, so it adds speed to the, to the crypto, but, well, it wouldn't be a direct connection. Right. Uh, but I think it's a good idea, especially for uh, the pipe test, to, to consider that. Uh, in, in the test I have so far, I've, I've benchmarked everything that I have from a Core 2 Duo through every different generation of Intel with a mix of laptops, desktops, and servers in there. And uh, yeah, it mostly has to do with the L3 cache size, where the sweet spot for the pipe buffer size is. And I think the same thing applies here is that, you know, as long as your socket buffer size fits in your L3 cache, it probably, uh, if we did on one CPU looking at just the socket buffer size, there's probably 
uh, a detriment to having your socket buffer, if it's the only connection going, being bigger than your half your L3 cache. I'm guessing you're testing mostly on single connection. Yes, this was all. Um, the first round of tests were parsing the output of DD, but when I got rid of DD, what I'd used is the IPFW count rules uh, over, you know, there's one NIC, all it's doing is having the delay, and we're counting the exact number of bytes that went from the here to here in this window, then zero it and do the next test after sleeping for long enough for the TCP host cache to clear. Uh, I, I set that to expire very quickly. Uh, it turns out if you disable the TCP host cache entirely, the socket buffer auto sizing seems to not work. I need to talk to somebody from the transport group about that. What is wondering? I can't quite put my finger on why I'm thinking this might be a problem, but does using the host cache in the Possibly. Uh, all my testing was over a perfectly silent 40 gigabit back-to-back -back connection between two servers in a test lab. So, yeah. Um, as, as, a, as a slightly selfish person, when I'm sending my data from Toronto to Melbourne, I don't care if I'm causing other people problems. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just want my data to get there in less than three days. <laughs> other questions? Other ideas of what I should do next? Oh, yes. Yes. So the NUD Mac is my patch set and the remote receive buff and the fix for the dynamic window. Um, I built the NUN Mac one on top of the HPM patch because they already had the NUN cipher and the, the checks to make sure that you don't use it when you shouldn't. Um, so I need to polish things up a little bit. Uh, on my GitHub, I've caught all of these patches up to the recent released version of OpenSSH because a lot of this work was done originally uh, around Christmas time uh, and to be done for my paper for Asia BSDCon in March. Uh, but the patches are on my GitHub, Alan, GitHub, Alan Jude, OpenSSH, portable. Uh, there's one called Dynamic Window, and that patch is against base SSH, and it gives you most of the game, if you just want to use AES GCM and you know high latency link, and it'll work. Uh, so that's a very small patch against stock SSH. All the other features like remote receive buff and the nun Mac and so on are all enhancements to the the um, HPN patches. And I've been working with those guys upstream uh, to hopefully those will be part of the HPN patch set. Uh, and I'm sorry, Brian, for the extra work that'll cause you. Um, so yeah, uh, hopefully some of this will be available to everybody as part of stock SSH and the more controversial features will be part of the HPM patch set and you'll be able to just use them. Uh, the other one I randomly stumbled into is that in the HPM patch set, they have a feature called multi-threaded AES, uh, where they have a, a version of AES CTR that can use more than one CPU at a time. Turns out, because that one was predates AES and I and doesn't use AES and I, is actually slower than using one core with AES and I. So I talked to them about it a little bit. In some of their tests, the performance was actually about the same, but it turns out it's because they were testing on very low uh, frequency older Xeons. So like their Xeon was like 1.8 gigahertz and mine's a modern 3.5 gigahertz one. Like these are uh, E5 V3, so that's Broad uh, Haswell or Broadwell, one of the two. Haswell, I think. Uh, so with the original version of this, I finished for Tokyo. My home servers, which are only 2.4 gigahertz uh, E5s, because they're 2620, so they have higher core count but lower frequency, um, couldn't quite do 10 gigabits. But I think uh, now that I learned that sticking some extra pipes in there doesn't help, uh, that I probably get most of the 10 gigabits anyway out of my home lab, uh, even though I have more than a gigahertz less uh, power out of one core. One last, hopefully last question. Uh, what is the
minor patches get upstreamed, the whole HPN patch thing can just fade into obscurity as long as you're running on ASNI equipped CPUs. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, in particular, this came up, uh, I think it was Julian Ellisher found that when we removed the HPN patches from FreeBSD's, the version of SSH of FreeBSD base, it actually reverted some, brought back some performance problems he was having. Uh, and so that's what drove me to make a version of this dynamic window patch that applied to just stock SSH, not only the HPN version. So the advanced features for doing one-off, really big fat stuff with no encryption or whatever, will we'll go into HPN and it'll be, you can get it from, you know, open SSH portable from ports with the HPN option. So uh, Well, that would require having a fast connection on OpenBSD. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how good OpenBSD support for 10 gigabit NICs is. It works. Do they have 40 gigabit NICs? Don't know. Okay. Warner has something to say. Oh, uh, Intel has a library on ISA. ISA-L, yes. That's the one. ISA-L, were you using that for these tests? No, uh, but as a separate project, I would really like the Open Crypto Framework to, to grab some of those, you know, assembly optimized versions of uh, the ciphers like AES, GCM, and maybe eke a bit more performance out of that. Yeah, that's, that's not one of the ways that's what uh, Yeah. Yes. So, are you doing that through the Open Crypto Framework, or do you just completely go around that at Netflix? We don't use the Open Crypto Framework. Right. So did you guys just add Yasm as part of your tool chain or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so if I just import Yasm into the contrib, we can just have it? If you played that battle, you can ISS up. Okay. <laughs> That's a deal. Ed and I already decided to do it in Tokyo, so. <laughs> All right, thank you.